Okay. Hello, everyone. On behalf of IBM Systems Magazine, I'd like to welcome you to our event. My name is Janine Donnelly. I'm the manager of webinars for IBM Systems Magazine, and I will be the moderator for today's event. We will be holding a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. You may ask a question at any time during the event by entering it into the Q&A panel. If you experience technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the Q&A panel to alert us and someone will assist you. You may download a PDF version of the slide deck by clicking on the drop-down menu labeled Event Resources, and you'll find that on the left side of your screen. And also be sure to check out the Event Resources tab for a data sheet related to today's discussion. And you can download both assets from the platform without leaving the webcast. Today's webinar, Mainframe Virtual Tape, Reinvented for a New IT Era, is sponsored by Optica Technologies. Our featured speakers today are Michael Daly and Serge Ryu. Michael is the VP of Sales for Optica, responsible for worldwide sales strategy and operations. Prior to joining Optica, Michael held a variety of executive roles in sales, product marketing, and strategy at IBM as well as other companies. Serge is a senior solutions architect at Optica with a 30-year background in tape and disk storage solution design and architecture, including systems engineering, systems integration, and quality assurance. Today we'll discuss new concepts in performance scalability and resiliency for mainframe virtual tape and address all the questions you've been contemplating about virtual tape. So with our introductions complete, Mike, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Janine. Um, I'm Mike Daly, and uh, certainly appreciate the uh, the work and support that IBM Systems Magazine has done to help us prepare for the webinar. I do want to let you know uh, before I go through the agenda that we do have a, a third player with us today, Sean Seitz, who runs our um, technical services organization, everything from pre-sales through post-sales technical support. And Sean will help us field some questions as we go through the process today. And, uh, and given he may be answering some questions directly, I wanted to make sure that you knew that he was on the call today as well. So let me review the agenda, and, and then, we'll, when then we'll get started. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background uh, about Optica and, and kind of why we think the mainframe virtual tape market makes sense for us. I'll give you uh, a new update and overview of our ZVT next generation product that we announced on May 1st that we're quite excited about. And then we'll do a little deeper dive, uh, talk a little more, more detail about um, our virtual tape node on kind of what that means and what the details look like. Uh, and then talk about our flagship product, the, uh, the 5000 iNAS, uh, and give you an understanding of, of how we've engineered hardware compression and deduplication for that product. Talk a little bit about data resiliency and, and how we leverage distributed resilient data um, to, to, to maintain the integrity of, uh, of the storage uh, that we're working with for the 5000 iNAS. Talk about its modularity uh, and scalability and flexibility so that we can architect a solution that meets your precise requirements in, a, in an efficient package. Also want to talk about high availability. Uh, we're excited to uh, we recognize that the, the mainframe market uh, you know, requires, in many instances, uh, zero downtime. And to have a high availability, no single point of failure solution in the mainframe virtual tape space is, is important and meaningful for us. And we want to introduce you to, uh, to that in the 5000 INAS. And then we'll also talk about how we handle replication uh, and encryption for that solution. Uh, and then we'll also talk about uh, DR testing and recovery, which we think is a, you know, a pretty uh, efficient process that we've established with the 5000 INAS and, uh, and something that can be automated for, uh, for your business and your, uh, and your requirements. And then we'll obviously handle any, any questions uh, that make sense during the presentation as they come along, uh, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll close from there. So I hope that makes sense. A uh, little bit of background on Optica. We are a, a privately held company. We're based in Louisville, Colorado. Uh, we've been in business for, for over 50 years. 
the last 30 or so, uh, we've been focused on the mainframe. And so that is our focus. Uh, that's, uh, uh, we're not distracted by, uh, by open systems opportunities. Um, we've built our business around the mainframe and have had the pleasure of being a strategic IBM Z partner and an exclusive provider of channel conversion solutions for IBM Z since 2002. Uh, and that privileged position has, uh, has paid some benefits for us. Number one, we're, we're in thousands of data centers worldwide, and that's given us a, a, not only a keen understanding of customer requirements and the expectations they've got, um, but it's allowed us to, to hone our technical support processes, our, uh, our logging and tracing capabilities with our solutions, uh, so that we can deliver a high level of customer satisfaction, regardless of the customer size. We've serviced the, the largest mainframe customers, the most demanding mainframe customers in the world, uh, down through the smaller business class users. And uh, each one um, has a demanding set of requirements that, uh, that we take great pride in the way that we service. Uh, it also demonstrates, I think, uh, or has allowed us to make a deep commitment to the mainframe. Not only have we been able to bring skills on board and develop world-class knowledge of, of mainframe protocols, uh, our products, uh, particularly the conversion products, um, have been through the rigorous uh, systems uh, assurance kernel testing at IBM Poughkeepsie, and the products are there uh, to this day as IBM introduces main, new mainframes uh, to make sure that, uh, that our conversion products are compatible. Uh, and so we've been able to leverage the learnings from that process to, to add value to our virtual tape solutions as well. Um, believe it or not, 70 or 75% of the devices connected to our conversion products, PRISM in particular, are tape, uh, virtual tape or devices that, that act like tape. Uh, so in order to support those third-party products, we've, uh, we've had to develop our own tape emulation capability. Um, we've got the physical tape and virtual drives uh, in our mainframe lab in, uh, in, in Louisville, Colorado. Um, and it's given us a keen understanding of, of tape operations and support requirements. So as we, as we thought about uh, serving markets that, uh, that IBM Z has identified, we sit down with IBM every six months or so, uh, the Z group, to, to talk about where there's a need. Um, Back in, uh, in 2013 or so, we started to look at the virtual tape marketplace uh, and identified that, that there, was, there was likely going to be a requirement for another choice for customers. And so with IBM support, we announced the ZVT family of products in January of 2015. And then uh, most recently, as we said, announced the next generation uh, ZVT products in, in uh, May of this year. So why did we enter the market? Um, just a little bit of color here, and it's kind of an update to a chart that we've covered in the past. We have to remember it's a sub $1 million marketplace. And what we've seen, and, and it's really evidenced by end of support announcements across uh, a set of products from 2016 through 2018, that, that IBM, Dell, EMC, and Oracle are increasingly serving the ultra high end of the market, that, that, that large enterprise. Um, but that the medium to large enterprise and, and smaller enterprises are having fewer choices. And so we've really focused on developing uh, a solution in the ZVT family of products that serves the broader mainframe market, that gives us the ability to establish something that's, that's easy to deploy, that's flexible, um, that's modular, but scalable to meet the broadest uh, segment of, of marketplace requirements. And we think we've done that with with the next generation of ZPT products. As I said, we announced the, the, uh, the product line on May 1st. Uh, it's actually generally available as of yesterday. Uh, and I think what it does is, it, it, you'll see as we go through this, I think it does demonstrate that we are absolutely committed to the virtual tape market. Um, we're happy to please, uh, we're happy to serve the marketplace, uh, delighted with the opportunity. And I think what you'll see is we've developed this, this flexible blend um, of solutions that, that gives customers the, the ability to make trade-offs around performance, capacity, and features. Uh, we also provide a set of solutions that gives you high availability, 
no single point of failure options, um, to a broad set of, of customer requirements, and and we can uh, we can do this in an efficient form factor. For example, uh, the new Z14 ZR1 uh, is 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 ready to be deployed if you uh, if you take advantage of that 16 U of available rack space with our base level HA unit, which which is only 9 U high. Uh, the other benefit uh, of the next generation of products it does take advantage of our world class service and support capabilities. Uh, and the satisfaction guarantee that we put in place around our entire product portfolio. So we talked about the next generation uh, announcement. Let me give you a little bit more color about that. Um, so the virtual tape node, um, which is the engine down there on the lower right that we use to, uh, to write virtual volumes to, uh, to a variety of disk solutions. Um, it has been has been updated. It's our fourth generation platform. Uh, it's our second generation ZBT platform, but but obviously we've leveraged the experience uh, and capability to deliver what we think is the finest and most stable platform that we've ever delivered. Um, it gives us the latest server technology in terms of cores and threads. Uh, we've incorporated hardware compression as a standard. Uh, and that's given us the capability to establish what we consider to be a conservative but reliable 500 megabytes per second throughput per VTN, and that's scalable uh, depending on the solution that you deploy. Uh, obviously, there's, there's some variance in terms of performance, but we've gone what we think is conservative and expect customers will see at least 500 meg of, of performance uh, in most of the environments they run. And in many instances, it'll be higher. But we like to use that to simplify uh, the way that we, we design and, and architect solutions for the customer. Obviously, as you'd expect, we'll have fully, fully redundant com components. Um, and we'll talk about uh, the licensing of virtual drives that we've, uh, that we've done differently with this product. Um, so let's talk about the 5000 INAS, and then we'll go into a little more detail uh, as we move through the charts. This is our flagship product. Uh, it's an integrated and fully featured product. Um, it comes with a variety of building blocks. So the way we design a solution is by leveraging a combination of virtual tape nodes, uh, intelligent storage nodes, which deliver capacity and advanced features, which we'll cover in a second as well as the ability to deploy a capacity storage node. So that's for capacity only. The benefit of, of leveraging all three of those in combination is that um, if, if, you, if we identify uh, a performance requirement uh, and a set of features that you need, but you have a, a large capacity, you don't have to license software on the capacity storage node. So it gives you some financial flexibility um, that you wouldn't have to, to other, uh, you wouldn't otherwise be able to take advantage of um, if we didn't have those three. And we'll go into those in a little bit more detail. Um, they're licensed for 256 drives per VTN. Um, you can deploy up to eight in a single uh, 5000 INAS solution for a total of 2,048 virtual tape drives per system. Um, we'll go through uh, the high availability base solution. We support high availability multi-node with the solution. Uh, it comes standard with deduplication. We talked about hardware compression. We'll talk about the relationship of those and how they work together uh, in just a little bit. They're available with replication, uh, encryption both at rest and in flight, uh, and, and worm capability. So that's our flagship product. Um, the 3000i uh, next generation product uh, is our virtual tape node with internal storage. Uh, we're now deploying that with 8 terabytes of internal RAID 6 storage. With hardware compression, that's about 20 terabytes effective. So that's a lot, much larger capability than our previous 3000i had. Um, as we said, hardware compression is standard. And then we standardized the license support for that with, uh, with 16 virtual drive standard. Uh, and then the final member of the family leveraging our, our virtual tape front end or gateway uh, is the 5000 Flex. And that allows you to leverage your strategic investment in, uh, in NFS NAS storage or fiber channel SAN storage. And that solution comes with either 16, 64, or 256 virtual tape drives. Uh, and again, that allows you to, uh, 
it, it, what we recognize with Flex after our first generation of product is, is that's where we see a wide variety of customers that uh, if you've got a strategic investment in, uh, in open system storage, you may have a small requirement for, uh, for, uh, for mainframe virtual tape. It might be larger and we need to be flexible to, uh, to support those three options. Uh, but additionally, it leverages existing storage features such as replication or deduplication or encryption that you're already leveraging your storage. Customers like Flex that, uh, that if they've got, uh, for example, replication already set up between the production data center uh, and the DR site, it gives them one replication solution for the enterprise, both open systems and, um, and mainframe. And that's been, uh, been interesting. Uh, to, uh, to prospects and, and customers that have deployed it. So a little more color on the, uh, on the virtual tape node itself. So each node, each VTN, uh, comes with two FICON interfaces to the mainframe. Um, each virtual tape node, depending on the, uh, depending on the product, um, comes with either 16 for the 3000i, uh, 256 for the 5000i NAS, and then the 5000 Flex has all three options for virtual tape drive license support. Um, we support all of the major mainframe operating systems. Uh, storage connectivity for the 5000 iNAS is 10 gig standard. Flex, you can see we have the uh, a one gig option as well as uh, an eight gig fiber channel. And the 3000i is obviously internal, uh, and we've uh, uh, archi architected that to be RAID 6 internal storage. As Serge will take you through, we, we have a different technology that we use for, uh, for the INAS, and, uh, and there's good reason for that. Uh, mainframe virtual drive emulations, we emulate both 3490 and 3590. Um, you, can, uh, uh, you can deploy both of those at the same time, so it's not an either or question. Uh, in terms of features, uh, we have a very intuitive uh, graphical user interface. Um, our customers have, and partners have kind of indicated that's the most intuitive interface they've seen uh, as far as mainframe virtual tape goes. Uh, if you're not a GUI person, uh, we, uh, we also, anything you can do with the, with the GUI, uh, you can do with the command line interface. Uh, we also support JCL uh, with, uh, with all models of the ZVT. Another interesting feature of the product is we support up to 32 virtual tape libraries per ZVT node. Uh, that's more than most people need, uh, but certainly great for multi-tenant environments. Uh, great if you want to uh, isolate uh, volumes. So if you have a, uh, an LPAR for, uh, for production, an LPAR for test, um, or if you've got uh, multiple lines of business and you happen to be using the same vault series but want to, alt want to isolate uh, those volumes by, by library, uh, it gives you some flexibility to do that. Uh, additionally, we support over a million virtual uh, volumes uh, per ZVT node. That's what we see. That's our largest um, deployment in production today. Obviously, in the lab, we have the capability of, uh, of demonstrating and supporting uh, others, but we like to be uh, conservative in terms of support commitments uh, around virtual volumes. Um, additionally, uh, we, we, uh, we do do CR checking, so when we write a volume to, uh, to disk, um, we do pass along that CRC to make sure that if there, if there has been a, 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 a corruption or, or an issue with the volume, um, that that can be identified uh, by the user. And then finally, we use the proprietary AWS file format. Um, it's obviously, from our perspective, uh, it's your data, uh, and it's important for you to be able to, uh, to access it, um, regardless of whether or not uh, ZVT is in the picture, and, uh, and using a non-proprietary proprietary AWS file format gives us the flexibility to, uh, to do that. Uh, and then finally, uh, we talked about the investment we've made uh, in our mainframe lab uh, in Colorado. And by the way, Surge runs that lab uh, for us. Um, and we've done integration and testing with the leading tape manufacturers uh, and tape, excuse me, tape management applications and tools. So IBM, CA, um, IDP, CSI, DTS, and others. Um, those are, are all in our lab, and, uh, and many of those manufacturers also have ZVTs running in their labs. So we work together to make sure that uh, our customers are, are supported and, uh, and delighted with, with ZVT. 
Let me, one more, uh, a couple of comments just to introduce compression and deduplication, and then uh, what I'd like to do is have Serge do a little bit deeper dive. So we've engineered ZVT um, so that the virtual tape node uh, includes hardware compression and that the intelligent storage node uh, incorporates deduplication. And the way we've engineered this is that we see value and, and you'll see value in that combination. Uh, so what it does is it gives us the capability to optimize throughput, right, so that we can deliver a solution that delivers against your expectations of throughput, uh, as well as makes the most efficient use of, of storage capacity. So that combination of, uh, of hardware compression and, and deduplication, um, we see value in it and want our customers to be able to take advantage of that value. But let me have Serge to kind of take you through the process um, and, and how we manage it with, uh, with ZVT and ISN in, uh, in an INAS environment. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, basically, what we do is um, the uh, ZVT uh, will take the data from the mainframe in clear, then that data gets compressed and um, by the ZVT directly. So when it, we pass the data over to the storage side, it is already compressed. So we there first limit the amount of data that's written so it gives us a better bandwidth on the back end of the, to the storage. And as a file gets written, uh, it's divided in chunks and that is done in line or in, in stream as the data is received as opposed to waiting till the data is written on the disk and then deduplicating from there. And the technique used, the technique used here is basically um, an elastic buffer, if I can use that, that term. Uh, it's not a fixed size buffer. The data is at, constantly analyzed as it's coming in and split into chunks of different sizes and compare to the hash table that's stored. And that allows us to be very efficient and fast on identifying data that is replicate, that is uh, duplicate. Once we've uh, got the data into chunks, we take a chunk and then we split it in nine parts plus three parities. So it gives us a total of 12 fragments for each chunk of data that we get. And then we take those 12 fragments and scatter them around the 12 drives on a storage, an intelligent storage node. So again, that allows us to have a good um, balance of data and parity separated or s spread across multiple uh, drives there. And if we look at how, <clears throat> so if we look a little bit closer at how it works, we go from the top, we have our data chunk that has been separated into nine um, parts of data, and we calculate three parities. And that is spread across all 12 drives with an algorithm that ensures that there's a certain number of each uh, parity and data on different drives. So if we are to lose, um, actually, first of all, that gives us the standard resiliency. Um, it can be configured from three to six, level three to level six. What we call level three resiliency is we can have up to three concurrent disk failures without affecting the system. And that's basically because of the way the data is stored across all those 12 drives. Um, we can dynamically allocate uh, resiliency levels per file system. So if you have data that is not quite as critical, you can say, okay, well, I'll give it, I'll take a chance of losing up to three drives on that data. If you have critical data that needs to be uh, fully redundant, basically you, you can lose up to six drives on a single storage node out of 12. Of course, the higher the resiliency level, the more you need to have um, resiliency capacity. So you lose on your storage capacity as you increase that level. So three is a standard. Uh, we figure three out of 12 is a really good ratio. And it gives us 25%, uh, it has a 25% capacity overhead, basically. And it's, we, we, we believe it's a 50% greater production than RAID 6. As RAID 6, you have two disks in a RAID, a RAID that you can lose. Um, so that gives us an extra disks there. 
and there's no idle or spare drives. Every drive is used to store data or parity um, as it's scattered. <clears throat> and it's a faster um, self-healing system with less performance degradation simply because the data is across multiple drives. So let's say you lose a drive, for instance. If you lose a RAID 6 drive, the entire drive is rebuilt, and that's one drive. So every bit of data needs to go be written to that single drive. If we lose a drive because of the way the data is scattered across multiple drives, the data reconstruction happens across multiple spindles. So we'll read data from different places and write it back to that drive, but it's not constantly, it's, it's available, the data, the data is still available even as the rebuild process happens because it can still be rebuilt from the other fragments that, that reside on other drives. So there's no performance degradation during the data rebuild. Um, data and parity fragment are basically redistributed across the storage. And Mike, I will let you take over from here for the. Yes. Yeah, so we so we talked about building blocks, um, and so let's just talk about uh, kind of the modular way that we can scale and deliver a highly available solution. We talked about the three elements. We've got our virtual tape node, um, we've got our intelligence storage node, and our capacity storage node down down the left hand side of the chart. Um, you know, each node gives us 500, uh, 256 um, virtual drives, 500 megasecond throughput. Um, each intelligent storage node gives us 72 terabytes of raw capacity. Now, we that 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 uh, that storage node is also available in 36 terabytes of raw capacity and can be upgraded with a software license. So we can meet a wide variety of customer requirements with that. But that also includes deduplication standard. Uh, it includes replication capability, uh, encryption, and, and worm as, as optional features. If we deploy those together in a base configuration um, as a high availability solution, you know, that gives us two virtual tape nodes, uh, two, um, two ISNs, uh, 1,000 meg of throughput. Uh, it gives us 144 terabytes raw. If we want a high availability solution, meaning no single point of failure and access to 100% of my data, um, we need to use level six erasure coding. Um, it's rare for us to lose three drives in a node. It's not, I, we've never had it happen. Um, it, it's even rarer for us to lose an entire node, but this base high availability configuration gives you the capability to lose an entire storage node and not lose access to your data. And we can do this in nine, in nine U of rack space. Once you've established your, your, your base configuration in terms of performance and features, um, if you want to add additional capacity, we can do that with the CSN. And each CSN has the capability of being deployed with up to 70, 72 terabytes uh, raw um, with support for up to 165 CSNs or a combination of ISNs and CSNs in a single solution. So it's very easy for us to deploy modularly and drive up to eight virtual tape nodes, uh, 4,000 meg per second of throughput, uh, a petabyte or more of raw data, uh, and up to 11 petabytes raw capacity overall if you wanted to deploy all of the nodes because of your capacity requirements. So we can in increase performance, capacity, and resiliency, resiliency in combination by, by architecting the proper base solution uh, and giving you the right combination of nodes to, uh, to support that requirement. Let's talk about high availability, the high availability configuration in, in, in a little more detail. Obviously, um, we're, we're providing a, a cluster of up to eight virtual tape nodes in a single 5000 iNAS solution. That gives us any-to-any -any file system access. Uh, and and what what happens is on the on the uh, on the on the right side you see the depiction of a of a solution with uh, with four active clustered virtual tape nodes and that top node is the primary database VTN 
um, the, uh, the standby VTNs below that uh, use that database, use the database of the primary VTN for, for all of their file access. And we use a locking mechanism to prevent two VTNs from accessing the, the same tape at the same time. And in the unlikely event of a failure, um, there is a, uh, an election process by which a standby virtual tape node automatically assumes responsibility for, uh, for that vault here. Uh, with, with no loss of data or impact to, uh, to I.O. operations. That's kind of a high-level view. Um, I hope that makes sense. Hey, Mike, if I could jump in here. This is Sean Seitz speaking yeah. with Optica. We actually had a question posted that uh, aligns with this chart, and so if it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and read the question and address it here while we have the graphic up. Okay. And then we can ask, I'll ask Serge to, uh, to answer if that's okay. So mm -hmm. the question is as follows. In a high availability environment, how is the integrity of the database managed in the event that a ZVT node has a hardware failure? So I'll repeat the question. In, a, in an HA environment, how is the integrity of the database managed in the event that a ZVT node hardware the ZBT node hardware fails. So, Serge, if you don't mind taking that, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, basically, the database is clustered across all nodes, and um, it, it is constantly replicated. So, from the primary, any action taken to that database is automatically replicated to the three standby unit, in this case, in, in the diagram that we see here. And if for any reason that primary goes away, it's automatically detected by the secondary nodes, and they, in, in between the nodes, will actually go through an election uh, process to determine who becomes the new primary node. And, and even if uh, the ZBT that is, um, used to be the primary, basically, if it's a hardware failure, it's possible that that node is potentially still active, but the database is no longer responding or there's other issues with that unit. At that point, that unit will get fenced until it can be replaced. So there is, it actually will be completely powered off um, to ensure that it no longer interacts with the rest of the system as we have detected a hardware issue. And okay. then one of the standby will become the primary and operations will continue normally. Great. Anything else to add there, Serge? Um, no, I, I believe we're good on this. Um, okay, great. There's additional questions? No, let's move on. Um, so just to, before we move on to some of the to replication and, uh, and encryption around 5,000 INS, let's just, I just want to quickly cover the maintenance support model around the ZVT portfolio. For those of you who have experience with Optica, and our, our PRISM product, um, the good news is it's the same process that we use. So we have 24 by 7 uh, telephone and email support. Um, we can establish uh, remote access via VTN or remote desktop uh, to collect the diagnostic uh, bundles, including logs and tracing, which, as we talked about, are, uh, you know, have been developed over a period of 15 years. and. And, uh, and give us a tremendous capability to, uh, to isolate and, and detect issues that arise. Um, we have a technical services team uh, that performs the, anal the analysis and prob problem determination. Um, we've, we've got, uh, obviously, level three support uh, and engineering that are joined at the hip. Surge is, is one of the resources we have in Colorado. He sits right next to engineering, so the beauty of, of of, of our organization is that relationship um, between technical services and engineering is uh, is is responsive and and flat and and natural. So the process of of, of engaging engineering in in, uh, in issues is uh, is well established and efficient. Um, however, you know, in the rare event that we do have a defective uh, piece of hardware, um, we we. We will expedite the, pro the, the, the field replaceable unit uh, via the fastest service necessary, um, and that's obviously overnight. 
and we subcontract to uh, to IBM. So we have the capability. It's Optica maintenance. We have the capability to deploy an on-site technician to uh, to execute the hardware replacement, and it's typically um, you know that that same resource that's familiar with your data center. Uh, and your mainframe. That process has worked very well for us um, over the last decade plus with PRISM. It's working equally as well uh, with, uh, with ZVT. All right, now I'll, let me ask Serge to cover uh, the next several slides related to uh, replication, uh, encryption, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, DR testing and recovery. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, started with replication. Uh, replication only um, act on uh, unique, deduped, and compressed data. So that means if the data is in the hash table on both sides, on both the production side and the DR side, nothing is going to happen. The data is not going to get moved across because there's no reason for it to be moved since it's already in the other system. So it significantly reduces network overhead. Again, as the data gets deduped, if I see a new piece of data, that piece of data is going to be transferred across, but only that piece. Uh, and that's, as if you remember a little far back when we talked about the, the chunks and how they're split, so only those smaller sections of data would actually get replicated. So it's much less data being replicated and a lower overhead on your network. And as soon as you activate replication, encryption is activated as well. So your data is always protected in flight. Um, RPO and RTO considerations, it's an asynchronous point in time comp. So basically, you can set your replication on a given schedule. The minimum time for a schedule is five minutes. Uh, for a replication window. So you can, if you say you have a database that you would like to be replicated every hour uh, on a given file system, you can get that file system replicated hourly. And again, only the data that's changed is going to be moved, so it could be very fast. If you have full pack backups and, and a lot of data changing, you have to be careful when you create that window or schedule that window that your, your data replication can be done within that time window. So if I set, let's say, five minutes to replicate uh, a backup, and there's 10 minutes worth of data to transfer across, the second replication would be scheduled in five minutes, which means the first one will not be completed before the second one starts. So it's, it's um, basically um, you, you will look at your data, see how long it takes to replicate, and then be able to pinpoint or fine-tune those uh, replication schedules as, as you need. And this is a, on a per-file system basis. Um, DR testing can be performed without any impact on the production on the production or replication. And I'll go through that um, in a few, few slides. <clears throat> and the encryption feature uh, is encryption at rest. We already kind of quickly covered uh, encryption during replication. If you enable encryption, it's enabled on a file system basis. So as soon as you enable encryption, you'll be asked to enter a set of keys. So for each file system, there's an encryption, a data encryption key created. That data encryption key is secured or encrypted with a file system encryption key. And in turn, that file system encryption key is encrypted with the master encryption key. So it's very well protected. And the keys are scattered on the system the same way as the data is. So you could lose. It's not like it's on a system drive. If you lose your system drive, you lose your keys. They're the same way as the data is stored for that level of resiliency. Your, your keys are securely stored in the system. Um, Again, the encrypted data in flight is included with the replication. As soon as you turn it on, it will start encrypting. It will establish an encrypted session between the two sites. And again, if you use encrypted file systems on one side, as they get replicated, the keys will get replicated as well. So you don't have to worry about your primary system 
having different keys in your DR system. They're exactly the same and they're replicated as well. Now, I will walk you through a quick um, scenario of um, basically a DR, a DR testing and then the steps involved into recovering from a DR if you have a real DR situation. <clears throat> First here, we have a standard two-side configuration. Let's see, we have a prod and a DR. So our production system replicates into what we call a replicated set. That set is in a read-only mode and not accessible from the DR side. And the advantage of that is that if you need to do a DR test, you know you're not going to affect any of your production data because it's a separate system, what you would have to do is create a clone of that replicated production set and call it prod clone or whatever you would like to call it. <laughs> and uh, that will make sure then that clone becomes a read-write access to the file system. We provide uh, customized scripts for our customers to allow them to easily run a DR test without having to worry about too many things. So the script basically will walk you, uh, will walk you, quickly walk you through the script and, and what it does. So on the DR system, let's say you had a previous test, you, you have an old uh, clone there. The script will first unmount the clone storage from the, from the ZVT. It will unexport that file system so it becomes uh, free. You can it will rename that clone to clone old, so it's no longer the one you're going to use, and then it will create and export a new clone. Right. What that does is basically present the latest data from your prod replication into a new clone. So you have basically from your last replication snapshot, that is now the new data that will be presented to the ZVT then the script will mount that file system to the ZVT and delete the old prone, uh, prod clone from the system afterwards. And then all we have to do is the database will be rebuilt on the ZVT as part of that process, and your DR test is ready to go. Now, people sometimes think that, oh, if I have to replicate, do a clone of my production data, I basically need the space on my system for that. But what the clone does is it only clones the pointers to the data. Because it's a technique used in the storage, it allows us to just basically point at the data. If you're only going to read, we'll point you to the data. If you're going to write, we're going to start writing those chunks in the production clone, not affecting the replication. Now, the next one will be if we are done with our testing or if we had a real disaster, which is the same steps as a DR test, and we need to go back to our production environment, the steps are slightly different there. And again, we have scripts that will help you in achieving that. Uh, so first, we need to stop all tip operations to make sure that nothing gets written because now we're basically migrating the entire DR environment back to your production site. So tape, stop all tape activity before running the script. And then the recovery, the recovery uh, script will perform the following step. Say, similar to what we did to do the DR, unmount and unexport the prod clone um, in the DR ZVT in the storage node. Unmount and unexport the production side uh, file system as well. Then replicate the prod clone across to the real production site. So we have a replication set that gets created there. So that's the first step. And then from there, we basically rename the prod clone to prod, export it. To the store to the ZBT nodes and then mount it on the nodes and rebuild the database. 
right? And then as soon as you verify that your system is ready, you're ready to turn it back to production. And these are all automated through scripts. And again, once you reestablish your real production site, you can start your replication set going back to your DR site. Right. And on there, we have a, um, we had a previous question um, that was asked about what if I have two active sites that are each other's DR. You can the same way have replication going in both directions. So I have file systems on my DR on my production site, I have different file systems on my DR site, I can create replication policies in both directions. So each site will have an image of the other through replication. So that allows you to basically, you would use the same steps, you would export, make a clone of your um, DR replication on your production site, export it, mount it to the ZVTs, and they would be able to start working on that system as well. And on that, unless there's questions, I will turn it back to you, Mike. Hey, Serge, why don't we take a quick question? Um, I think we have time to, to do that and cover the last couple of charts. It, the question is, can we perform a DR test if we only have um, one VTN uh, and one uh, storage node, one ISN? You might have muted. Sean, have we lost Surge? Perhaps we have. I'm sorry, sorry. I was I was talking okay. and I was on mute. <laughs> sorry okay. about that. Um, yeah, basically you can um you can replicate the file system locally. So if only if you only have one node and you would like to do some some sort of DR testing, you could replicate your production environment on the same node. So create a clone of that production environment and then export that clone from the storage, mount it on the ZVT, or if you have a second ZVT and you just have one storage, or you can use a number of drives and mount that file system to to a separate library if you'd like. To do testing, so you can you can totally isolate both environments uh, by creating a clone of your production environment. So you would basically have a point in time image of your production environment, and you can mount that to a separate library with a smaller number of drives and run any test you need to run on that. Okay, and that's perfect for customers that, uh, that are perhaps moving from physical tape and 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 or don't have um, uh, a mainframe. Uh, in the uh, in the remote site, um, but are replicating data to the remote site, so they have another copy of it. it gives them capability to do uh, um, to do some DR testing in the production site. So that's a good option for uh, for some mm -hmm. time. All right, yeah. thanks, Serge. Uh, let's move on then uh, and uh, and start to summarize. So so clearly, ZVT provides a, a number of management benefits for you to consider. Um, it gives us uh, Seamless deployment and, and Optica does support the process, both the installation, uh, the configuration, implementation, migration, and skills transfer of our solution. Um, and so we support you throughout the process. Um, but obviously, there's no impact, right, to JCL, tape management systems, or tape operations. That's our goal: uh, is to try to minimize the uh, the issues associated with change. Uh, we can architect a solution that uh, that are, improves or delivers against whatever recovery time and recovery point objectives that you have. Um, we can support you know, all mainframe workloads, whether uh, you know whether you're doing DASB dumps, batch processing, um, wh whatever you require, uh, tiered storage. All those are are things that we can support. Um, and we design it again to try to improve TCO by being modular, by by being scalable. Uh, and and I didn't mention this in the in the ISN discussion. We talked about being conservative on performance per node, but even in the ISN, when we when we when we architect uh, the storage capacity for the INAS, we use a conservative 
uh, four to one basis for, for deduplication. That's the way we size opportunities. Oftentimes customers will see five to one to 10 to one in terms of that value. If you do, it gives you some flexibility in terms of your data retention policies. You might want to keep more copies of the data. Either way, it gives you some flexibility. At the same time, we think about sizing uh, the solution with the most uh, economic flexibility uh, that we can. And to that end, right, we've designed this solution, tried to be very smart about the architecture, um, the engineering, and the support processes we use. So, you know, so we think what we give you is uh, is also a kind of a, a, a lower annual support cost for ZVT over three years, uh, over four years, over five years, something to take a look at and consider. Uh, and then finally, you know, we're excited about next generation ZBT. Uh, we hope you take the time to, to learn more about it. Uh, again, we believe it's, uh, it's the most modular, scalable, flexible solution in the mainframe marketplace. Um, we now have high availability, no single point of failure options in an efficient form factor. We're Z14, uh, ZR1 ready, uh, and we've packaged it with the, the world-class service support and customer satisfaction guarantee that, uh, that that customers have expected from from Optica that we're uh, that we're proud to deliver. So with that, let me uh, let me uh, turn it back over to Sean to see if there are any questions that we can handle. I see it's about 1:52 now. We probably have time to handle one or two uh, uh, short questions. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yes, we do have some uh, a good handful of questions that were submitted here. I uh, would emphasize we'll address a couple here, uh, time permitting, and then any that we don't address or don't have time to, we'll certainly get back to you uh, very quickly by email uh, to make sure your questions are answered. First question um, that I'd like to address is, how difficult is it to migrate from my existing tape system to ZVT? And how does Optica support that effort? So that's a great question because I would say 100% of the engagements that we are involved with, uh, the very top of mind subject with our customers and prospects is how are you going to get my data from my current environment to your system? And how are you going to do it safely? So that's a great question. So we are very adept and experienced at assisting customers with the consulting and the services to migrate their data. So 100% of the time when we uh, sell a system, a ZVT system, we're going to include some level of migration service. We can actually do a level one, which is uh, a more cursory level migration support where we actually consult with the customer on the best tool set at their disposal. We help them test the migration process before we leave their, their location after we implement the solution, and we get them started with the migration to continue uh, on their own. The next level, which is a more comprehensive consulting service, is that we will bring our tool set to, to bear, and it's called ZCC, ZVT Control Center, and it has a very powerful migration component to the control center package. And we will actually uh, own that process for the customer. So we will uh, take the lead in migrating the data using our tool set. And then uh, that level of service, which is also available, is, is uh, one that makes sure that we own that process for you and we successfully migrate your data onto the new system from whatever environment you have, whether it's physical tape or uh, another virtual tape solution. So. So that's a great question. We have another question um, here that is very good. What is your relationship with IBM, or what is the relationship between Optica and IBM? That's a very good question because it can be it can be a little bit confusing. But we are fortunate to have several layers of partnership with IBM Z. Um, the first was born out of our um, ability to produce the conversion solutions that Mike talked about at the beginning of the presentation. So we were the exclusive provider of protocol converters to mainframe users when IBM got out of the business. So we signed a technology agreement with IBM back in 2002 to be the exclusive provider of protocol converters for their customers. So from that time forward, we've had a very, 
very good relationship with Z Systems in Poughkeepsie, and we've transferred that into a very strategic relationship where we consult with IBM on an ongoing basis in terms of our products that we bring to market, and that was the case with the, with the ZVT as well, and that they were very supportive in recognizing that the marketplace required another solution, in fact, to complement IBM's own solution. So we have a strategic partnership, a technology partnership, and we're also in the partner world program where we are a development partner. So we actually have a Z mainframe in our lab that we use to develop and test our products. So it's a multifaceted arrangement. Uh, in fact, there is a fourth in that we partner with them for support. So our hands and feet are IBM SSRs. So IBM is actually complements our support capability in the field and that they're our hands and feet on site. So we have a multi-level arrangement with IBM and uh, we, we appreciate it and, uh, and, and really use it to our advantage in the marketplace uh, because the customer gets a lot of benefit from those uh, relationships we have. Okay, I think that's all the time we have for questions. For the handful that we haven't answered, we'll make sure we get back to you as soon as possible by email and answer your questions. Thanks, Sean. Why don't we uh, turn it back over to Janine uh, for kind of final instructions here. Hey, thanks, Mike. Um, I did want to mention, for those of you who may have joined late, that you can download a PDF version of the slide deck right from the platform. So if you go to Event Resources, located on the left side of your screen, you can download both the slide deck, and then there's also a data sheet there, too, um, that you may be interested in. So while you do that, I just want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, and I especially want to thank um, Mike, Serge, and Sean for sharing their expertise with us today. Later this week, we will be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the recording of today's webinar. So please watch for that. That concludes our webinar. Thanks again for joining us, and have a great day.